Welcome to Chatterbooks, Episode 1. Chatterbooks is here to introduce you to independent British authors and books, to help you find the real gems in the huge amount of small press and self-published books that are available. Today I'm reading from Penny Grubb's Buried Deep, one of the Annie Raymond PI series. This is the blurb from the back of the book. Surrey-based Damien Marks has no idea that his wife has employed a private investigator to check up on him. And she has no idea that a police team in York see his inexplicable behaviour in a far more sinister light. He's the prime suspect in a murder inquiry. Detective Superintendent Martin Weber is appalled to find private investigator Annie Raymond slap bang in the middle of his case. Not that he takes her seriously but he has his own secrets that he can't afford for her to find. Then the death of a peripheral witness turns the investigation on its head. Meanwhile, oblivious to the entanglements of the adult world around her, schoolgirl Olivia Lamb hugs to herself the secret of the ghost hands she saw in the surging waters of a York flash flood. Prologue Annie Raymond snapped from relaxed to full alert, senses tingling, and for a moment she couldn't be sure why. Her target, Damien Marks, hadn't moved from his table in the window of the restaurant down the street, nor had he taken his phone from his ear. Crowd still bustled in all directions, drawn by the unseasonal sunshine. It was Annie's first ever visit to York, and it had been an unexpected destination. Until just now, She'd felt more like a tourist than a private investigator, her attention focused on the riverbank, intrigued by the casual way people brushed past the chain-link fence and sat on the edge, their legs dangling over the sheer drop several metres to the flowing water. Marks had told his wife he was on his way to Chelmsford today, but had then led Annie 200 miles north. She'd followed him on and off for a year and a half, uncovering secrets in his working life but not the other woman that his wife suspected. Several times she'd gone to the trouble of getting close enough to listen to his calls. Early in the surveillance, an arrangement to meet a Miss Price had her on her toes, but the woman proved to be an elderly estate agent and property deals were his legitimate business. Watching him, a moment ago, fiddling with his phone, breaking bits off a croissant, throwing an occasional glance towards the street, she wondered if it was some sort of midlife crisis, an urge to roam at random. Leaning on a wall, acting the tourist, she let the gaze of her camera phone roam along the mix and match, old and new, of York streets, while the camera panned high above the crowds to a second story jutting out, the flat brick wall of a converted warehouse, the modern glass expanse of the smart gallery, Annie's stare crisscrossed the crowds. And with an inner crow of satisfaction, she homed in on a woman strolling down the street from the other direction towards her target's restaurant. Was she about to find the elusive lover? Certainly this one was more the right age and bearing than the aptly named Miss Price. But something in her gait was wrong. It was too deliberately unconcerned, too measured. And as Annie watched, the woman walked past the restaurant window her head turning neither right nor left. Marx didn't react, didn't seem to see her as she strolled by. Annie, still the tourist, lowered her lens to follow the woman's path along the pavement towards the bridge over the river. Click. A couple walked off the bridge towards the woman. They passed each other. They didn't speak. They didn't exchange even the glance of strangers brushing past. Click, click, click. Before they were anywhere near it, Annie knew the couple would enter the restaurant. She glanced back towards the lone woman, who paused and leant her head discreetly to one side, perhaps talking into a hidden microphone. Her quarry chatted on into his phone, oblivious to the byplay, as the couple settled themselves at the table behind him. Annie melted into the crowds, needing complete invisibility to think this through. Damien Mark's wife was right. He was up to something, but it cost money to send three plainclothes officers to watch one man. This was nothing to do with an extramarital affair.
Chapter 1 Billy inched the tractor forward, feeling a flutter in his chest as the giant offside wheel sank in the soft earth. Then it climbed, rising itself, and he blew out a tiny sign. Razor-sharp judgment kept these beasts standing tall, and this close to the edge, the minutest of errors would spell catastrophe. Cool salt air blew in off the North Sea. The swish of the waves on the shale way below gave a background beat to the roar of the engine and the incessant squawks and squabbles of the gulls close behind. Hands steady on the controls, Billy stretched forward to peer at the rut left by a winter landslip. In less than a minute, he'd be on the other side of it, back on solid ground, the field ploughed to its edge like it should be. Inside his head, he smiled. Outwardly, his face showed no emotion. The gang with their metal detectors would be delighted. A new strip of ploughed earth that hadn't been disturbed in decades. He ran his tongue round his lips. They dried. The old man might pretend to be shocked, but he'd be pleased too. He'd laugh that cracked laugh of his. You old soak, Billy. So you did it, did you? She wouldn't laugh, though. The old man's daughter. That slip of a girl, fresh out of college marching in, giving the orders like she knew more than they did about the land they'd farmed between them for decades. He and the old man always bantered about this stretch. He'd say, How about it? And the old man would say, Good idea, Billy, good idea. Then the cracked laugh would wheeze out, and he'd add, You know what, Billy, let's leave it, just for this year. Not the girl, though. She'd had to barge in with her swearing, shouting that she didn't give a flying F how many fingers he lost. She wasn't having her machinery put at risk. Her machinery, mind you. Things would be done her effing way now if they wanted roofs over their heads. She'd seem to include her father, the way Billy remembered it. But surely, even a little bitch like that wouldn't turn out her own flesh and blood. He resented the reference to the three short stubs that accompanied his left thumb and forefinger. He tried to tell her, a man who'd had a tractor topple on him, didn't let it happen a second time. But he wasn't good with words, not when he was all het up. She growled at him that she'd break his effing neck if he effed up her new tractor. His mind skipped over the changes she'd brought in since she'd burst back into their lives. She might not have to turn anyone out. If everything were done her effing way, the farm would be bankrupt in a year. He eased the beast forward, hand steady, as the huge vehicle tossed him one way and then the other as it bounced in slow motion into the rut and out again. As he felt the wheels pull forward towards familiar ground, he saw the split deep in the clay. The weight of the tractor, bouncing into that rut, had ripped the ground apart, a gash running sideways towards the headland. His half-hand pushed against the lever. Sudden shock coursing through him as static exploded from the radio. What do you think you're effing doing, Billy? Snapped her voice, filling the cab, disorientating him. His head whipped round as though expecting her to have materialised beside him. He stared out across the earth, bewildered. Thirty empty acres stared back. Her yelling rang in his ears. He didn't reach for the radio. His insides had turned to jelly. His heart beat hard enough to burst it out of his chest. Mechanically, he let the tractor roll on until its huge metal tail was clear of the danger area. Then he stopped it. There was no urgency to his movements. It was as though he watched from outside himself, just as she was watching him, while she shrieked at him to get a move on, to pick up the effing radio, and to tell her what he thought he was playing at. He realised she must be right up in the top road with binoculars to be able to see him so clearly. She'd gone to some trouble to spy on him. I told you not to go near the edge, her shout crackled through the radio. And don't you dig out of that cab. Pick up the radio, Billy, now. She hadn't told him not to go near the edge. She hadn't actually said it. Climbing down, he barely felt the sharp tang of the sea breeze. It was as though he'd been wrapped in an invisible cocoon. Her words meant nothing. The trouble he'd be in for ignoring her meant nothing. He stumbled as he picked his way over the churned earth, 
His half hand reached out to the giant plough blades to balance him as he walked back. He noted that even she, with her swearing, couldn't compete with the fat plume of scavenging gulls clustered around the metal tail of the tractor. They shrieked at his incursion, flapping out of his way, then swooping back in, screaming defiance as he walked a few paces beyond the reach of the machinery and stopped to stare into the split earth. Bit of an old toy, he tried to tell himself. Nothing more. But the old man had kept him off this stretch for years, and she, with her swearing, had taken the trouble to come and spy on him. No cocoon around him as he stumbled back towards the cab, tears coursing down his cheeks, following the deep lines etched into his skin. I've not cried since I were a nipper, he thought. Static from the radio began to balance and then drown out the squabbling seabirds. She was still at it. Effing this, effing that. What are you effing crying for, Billy? That was a keen pair of binoculars she was using, wherever she'd stationed herself. As he reached into the cab and picked up not the radio receiver, but his mobile, her swearing took on an air of disbelief. Billy! Pick up the fucking radio! Billy! And he did. He opened the channel so she could hear his call. If you want to read more of this great novel and the others in the Annie Raymond series, then go to www.john-d-scotcher.co.uk forward slash chatterbooks. There you'll find details of how you can buy the book. Next time, I'll be reading from My Life Hereafter, young adult fiction by Lynette Ferreira. I'll see you then.